back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. My guest today is my friend Mike Hambright, better known as the Flip Nerd. And today's show is on a topic that um, I, I think about a lot and I know Mike does. And it's on how to build a business that's exceptional. How do you move your business from ordinary or average, which you know we've all been, been in that spot. But you, if you want to move it over to the exceptional uh, side of the of the page, if you say, how do you do that? So welcome, Mike. I'm happy to talk about this with you today. Hey, Sharon. Get great to see you. So um, I know, I, th I think everybody probably on the planet's familiar with you, but uh, how about you just give them a give them a little update on Mike Hambright? Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I don't know. I, I think I'm big in Europe. I don't know if I'm how big I am in the US yet. Uh, so. I'm a real estate investor in Dallas, and uh, I'm, honestly, as we speak right now, I'm actually going into many more markets. Uh, had a couple of like partnership type things pop up to where we'll probably be in a couple dozen markets actually by the end of this year. So, some some kind of big uh, changes there, I guess, in my business. Um, but uh, historically, I'm a real estate investor primarily in the Dallas Fort Worth market. I've done hundreds of deals here and mentored and coached people that do a thousand plus houses a year. Um, and uh, so a few years back, about, I guess about three, a little over three years ago now, we started, I started a podcast and a show much like this one where I interview experts in real estate investing that we call the uh, Flip Nerd Expert Interview Show. And uh, with that show, I just recorded one yesterday. So we did show number 347 wow. yesterday. Uh, and then about a year, a little over a year ago, we launched um, – another podcast called or in a show called uh, REI classroom that we have experts like, like you Sharon that come on and share quick, like five minute lessons. And we actually publish that seven days a week. So those are short ones, but we, you know, because we do so many, we publish essentially 365 shows a year. So I think that one we're, we're over 500 episodes now. And, uh, but we, we anyway, we, we we're creating a lot of content to try to give back to the real estate and investing community and to try to build our, our community and our, and our, our platform on flipnerd.com. And so um, I love to teach. I love to, I'm always, I'm kind of a natural connector. I love to bring people together. And, uh, and, and as a side benefit of that, and I'm probably, it'll come out more in the show is when you are that, that guy or that gal, the person that's kind of bringing all this together, opportunities just pop up from your network and relationships that you've built that you, you didn't really know. Uh, it wasn't like you were planning for that to happen, but things just happen. Um, because you just are kind of in the game more, I guess, and you have opportunities that pop up and that's one of the great benefits of it, I guess. Well, that's true. And, you know, in fact, um, um, it reminded me that we did a whole show on networking. So I'll have to put that link in here because yeah. Yeah, networking is a powerful thing. And like you said, you have no idea what's going to come your way just because of networking, but right. you do get a lot of opportunities and, uh, you know, it, it helps you in your business, helps you in your brand, and plus it just makes you happy to meeting all these fun people. Right, right, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about habits. Now, I think I've, I've always thought that one of the biggest predictors of success is habits, and I think everybody struggles with keeping and holding on to good habits. So how do you feel about that? Good habits. I've got some bad habits, but we yeah. won't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good habits, you know, I mean, I guess um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think this this is for real estate investors for sure, uh, because a lot of real estate investors in, in my, you know, as you know, statistically, most real estate investors, whether it's people that are trying to get started or whether they do a deal or two, but the failure rate is like 95% or some, mm -hmm. some really high number, which sounds, sounds crazy to me, but so my, my general belief is that the vast majority of those gave up before they ever got started, right? And so I think, um, you know, we live in a, in a age now where people want to pop a pill to lose 50 pounds and like mm -hmm. everybody wants immediate gratification on everything. And I think as you're building your business, you know, that it's, no, it's no different than the real world. I mean, like everything else is you, you have to overcome some obstacles and you're going to get hit with um, – issues that you didn't expect. And uh, I think what really kind of makes us as business people, as entrepreneurs, is that we, we're not willing to give up. Like this happened, but here's what I'm going to do now instead of just like, you know, the average person just is full of excuses. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that doesn't work for me. It's like, well, 
yeah, it does. It's yeah, just, it does. don't give up, you know? <laughs> um, and so I think it's just that fortitude of like saying, I'm not going to give up no matter what. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to adjust. I'm going to find my way. But uh, in terms of habits, I, I would, you know, I think that's probably one of the better habits that entrepreneurs should have is the ability to be willing to learn and know that you're going to get hit with obstacles that you cannot predict in any way. Uh, but just to kind of keep going because you learn, it's like, it's like a learning curve. You, you have to fail to learn. It's the only way forward. Yeah. And you know, when you were talking about all your shows, um, and sometimes I think people don't think so much about the habits to go into those things. But if you take that as an example, you have to have certain habits, certain rituals, certain procedures for getting it all done. And at the end of the day, if you just said, well, I've, I've got this show today with Sharon, but I, I, I think I'd rather go play golf. You didn't have the habit of following <laughs> through. Uh, you know, I think there is, there is something to that. It's, it's not easy, you know, being successful. It's not easy. And it's oftentimes you have to do the things you don't want to do. And oftentimes I think you're right. People just give up before they ever give it really a fair shot. Yeah. I think it's, the, I, I would kind of change what you said a little bit to it's not easy to try to be successful. I mean, cause I think what, I think you get to a point we were talking before the show here that there's some things that we're doing on our website and things like that, that we're just, you know, it, it took a whole lot of money, a whole lot of time, a whole lot of trial and error to learn that we've just overdone everything. We just need to simplify. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of us, tend to overcomplicate things and that prevents a lot of people from getting started because they think I have to do this hundred things before I can even start. And it's like, no, just do these five Yeah. and it's not going to be perfect. And you're going to know later that you should be doing more, but if it helps you get out of the gate, like don't, you know, don't, don't have, don't be sitting on the couch for years and say, the only way I'm going to run is if I can run a marathon next week. Mm -hmm. It's like start with a mile race or start with a walk or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, kind of, I, kind of, I guess kind of to play on your, your question on habits, I would say is to get structure in your life um, and so in, in your business. So for me, for example, for the, all the shows that I record, we typically record them at 10 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday mornings. We have very specific times. I've got a slot planned out for the whole year. And then if, I'm gonna, if I know I'm going to be on vacation that week, like we, I know some of my trips and stuff that I have that are going on for the rest of the year. I just say, hey, uh, to, to my assistant, I just I have to move it to Monday this time or the following week I'm going to double up and do two or whatever it might be. But for me, it's been on the things that are important to me that I know are repetitive. Um, and in your business, that could be things like reviewing your leads for the previous week or whatever other things, not just kind of content creation. But uh, I have a meeting on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. where I talk with my acquisitions team about our deals for the past week, our leads for the past week, what happened, where are we at? And so it's just to kind of get that structure in your calendar where this is what I do on this day at this time. Um, and I think that ultimately helps you be more, uh, more productive because you've got the important things slotted. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, and I feel like too, that if you're going to, it's, it's, you know, most people that don't quit stay way, stay a long time in the I'm average or I'm okay or kind of, they're stuck in this comfort zone. So I, I think yeah. too that you you need all those, you need uh, you need a schedule, so to speak, like your podcast and, and mine. I like to do them at certain times. It when they I used to do them all over the place and boy was that ever a, just a big hot mess. Yeah. Because you you can't get you can't work on projects because you're over here doing this then you're over here doing that. So I think that's important. But I think that's exactly one of the things that you've got to get if you're going to move over to the exceptional side of the business. But you touched on something else too a couple times and the people that you, you know, your team, your, your, your people that support you. And I think that is a big part of it too. And what, even if you're just starting out and maybe you have a person or, or, or two or a virtual assistant, you still have to put some time into those relationships. You have to, hire right you have to get the right people in your world otherwise that's just another problem yeah absolutely yeah people that's something that i've always struggled with i have some really good people on my team now but historically <clears throat> i need to add i need to add people historically i am terrible at at uh not just finding the right people mm -hmm. uh and not to blame anybody other than myself i mean it's some of it's a process problem. Some of it is that I wait till I need somebody so bad that I just 
start to justify like, ah, maybe, you know, I don't even necessarily say this, but in hindsight, it's like, well, they weren't really the right person, but I need somebody so bad that I just overlooked their shortcomings or whether they were the perfect fit. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing for me internally, you know, personally, I think in the past when I hired people, I was always, <laughs> real estate investors are cheap, right? Like we just yeah, want to do everything yeah. low budget. Yeah. So I was always, I was always, um, trying to get the cheap, you know, kind of trying to get something done for cheap. Yeah. And, and, and then what starts happening is like, well, they're not very good at that. So I'll just do that part. And, you know, you start to kind of justify ways. And the next thing you know, I'm doing half of their job because uh, they weren't qualified to do it, mm -hmm. but it allowed me to get somebody cheap. It's like, well, what does that cost me to have to do it? Mm -hmm. And what's, you know, what's my opportunity cost? What are we not doing now? Because I'm bogged down with this other stuff. Um, and so, I will say that paying more is not the answer always either because <laughs> yeah. I've, I've done that before. I literally at one point had uh, two admins. One of them I paid double the other and they didn't, I don't think they knew that, but I was like, and then it became clear to me of the one that I was paying double. I was like, I'd rather have two more of those people than one of those people. Yeah. And so money is not everything, mm -hmm. but I think uh, it's really important to find, um, you know, people that kind of understand what your mission is and, without kind of getting the whole show sidetracked on that, I, I would say that historically I've done a bad job of sharing with my team where we are going. It's, it's in my mind. I know what I want to do, uh, but I don't do a good job of kind of being a visionary to the point to where I'm laying it out for my team mm -hmm. and they know how to get on board and they know what we're doing. So I think um, some of it is just maturity as an entrepreneur or a business owner. Like I, I feel like I've gotten much better at that and I'm getting better. And I, more than anything, I'm aware of it now. Like for a long time, I wasn't even aware. <laughs> well, like, you know, after this I'm paying you. What else do you want? You know, it's like, no, yeah. no, they, they want to, they want to be a part of something, not just. And that is, that is really kind of where I, I wanted to head off to, you have to build a culture. And that's one thing that I've learned. And, and that involves you getting people to buy into your vision, to buy into your business. And you're right. It's not always about the money. It's sometimes it's about flexibility in their job. If they can get the job done, it's other things. But, um, you know, I think of, I know of a couple people that have built a great culture within their business and coincidentally, they're very successful. Yeah. But, but they had the same challenges that we have, that everybody has, and they just keep plugging away at it. And I, I, I do think that's a big part of this, the whole secret to ending up on the other side over here where you have an exceptional business is you got to really do go through a lot of pain <laughs> and a lot of you got to be able to admit your mistakes and say, okay, where am I and why, why am I here? But yeah. Hiring a warm body when you are just drowning in work is something everybody has done. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing that makes it complicates this whole thing is I know you, you're big on virtual staff. I have, I have, uh, every time somebody asks me this question, I have to sit around and think about it, but we have about 15 people on our team across my house buying business. We have rentals, we have mm -hmm. bookkeeper, we, and we do a bunch of video and stuff for Flipner. So most of them are on, on the Flipner side at this point, but, uh, like 10 of the 15 are virtual and they're all over the world. Like mm -hmm. some are in the U S some are the Philippines, some are in like Western Europe. So they're kind of all over the place. So mm -hmm. in my office I have, uh, including my wife and I, I'm just thinking right now we have three other people here, mm -hmm. my wife and I, now my wife doesn't work. She, she doesn't work as much as she used to because she's been able to kind of ease her way out. So she's in here maybe two days a week. Mm -hmm. I don't like to come here every day cause I, I just, I need, I go, I like to go work at Starbucks and stuff sometimes just yeah. to kind of get away from it all. And, um, of course, sometimes I'm traveling or out of meetings and other things like that. And then, um, one of the people that's here is only here part-time. She's a bookkeeper. She really only comes in about you know two days a week. Mm -hmm. So how do you build culture when you have a team, but they're kind of all over the place. And sometimes there's only two people in my office. Like it's hard to like, it's not like you're walking into Google or anything. <laughs> so, well, I think it is harder, but I think, um, I think you, the people that I know that have done it successfully, they have an office meeting with their virtual staff. Yeah. Pretty much like a zoom platform, like, uh, or any platform, right. they have a, they have an office meeting. Maybe it's at 10 o'clock Monday morning and they get the whole team together and the whole team talks about, um, things. Now there may be parts of it that you don't want to just, that you would have individual conversations with, 
but it is harder. But I, I do know this. <clears throat> when I started, when I closed my other business, uh, because for 10 years I, d I did two, and it's really hard to do two things very, you know, two businesses and do everything very well. <laughs> but I was very- Just two? <laughs> yeah. I, had, <laughs> I called them people to feed for 17 years. And, yeah. and I felt very much like they were my responsibility. And when I decided to uh, go full time in real estate investing, that was on the top of my list. I wanted few or no people to feed. So I just went about it differently. And I'm not going to say it was always easier, but in many ways, you know, when you work with virtual people, if you find the right people, it is pretty seamless. But that was, you know, that's not what works for everybody. That's, right. that's a very definite direction I went off in. And uh, it's kind of funny because I'm looking at maybe bringing somebody back in uh, uh, who happens to be a family, well, it's my daughter who I worked with for 17 years. So we're kind of like a right hand and a left hand. You know, she's, she's very entrepreneurial though, and she's very much... Uh, she's kind of like me in a lot in a lot of ways. She has different strengths, but she, you know, it, it's hard for people to understand small business if they've only worked at Humana. It's very right. difficult to take because the entrep the whole entrepreneurial thing, it's just different. Right. Yeah, I I struggle with that. Whenever we hire somebody, I I, I always, you know, I look to see where they're coming from or where they've been because mm -hmm. it's different here. Like it's not. It's, I worked for, I came from corporate America, so I understand, you know, huge companies, but it's not like that. We don't have the resources. Like mm -hmm. I need you to do this, but sometimes you might need to change the light bulb or whatever. I mean, it's just, you right. got to do what you got to do. And there's some people that really enjoy that small mm -hmm. um, atmosphere. I think you have to find those people that appreciate that this isn't as structured, but I think if you do it right. Um, and and as I, sometimes when I talk here, I'm like, I'm making notes to myself, like, Oh yeah, I need to do that. I've, I've I've thought about this before, but Sharon just shook something loose in my mind, for example. But well, uh, you know, it's yeah. uh, it is very different though. The people you need a very different type of person. Yeah, somebody that can understand that. Um, you know, you you just typically have to wear more hats in a small company, right? You got to like, I have a sales guy on my team that something just happened in my business. I'm like, man, this is not your job at all, but I just need you to help with this for a little while until I find yeah. another solution. And, and he's, he's cool with that. And so you got to find somebody that they can adapt like that. And they kind of, you know, they kind of understand that, um, that that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I worked for in a corporate America and it's where you're in this giant company and you've got this tiny little, job and you know my I was did very uh, research and development type of stuff so it was a lab and it was okay here's the whole lab but here's your job and what I found was I was really bored and I think with entrepreneurs you, you talked about being a dreamer I think most entrepreneurs are dreamers and the, the whole day-to-day now I don't want to do bookkeeping I'll get a bookkeeper it's kind of you, you don't want to be in that minutiae. You want to think about and decide on what the minutia is going to be and then yeah. have somebody else do the minutia. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So when we talk about um, building an exceptional business, you can't do that without talking about branding and authenticity. And boy, those are, those are big buzzwords now, but um, authenticity is so important you know you've got to it, it's the thinking thinking away feeling that way and talking that way applying it across the board because people they don't they don't just want it they demand it now you know they want to know if you're going to sell them um, uh, I think there was an example like if I make tomato sauce it used to be they would just go okay I need tomato sauce I'll buy tomato sauce so today they want to know well, where do you get your tomatoes? Are they organic tomatoes? Do you process the tomatoes in the U.S. or overseas? You know, and then what happens when you you say this is this about your tomato sauce? How do I know that's really true? And it's that way in everything in real estate. You know, it used to be okay. I've got a house here. You know, here here you go. But it it's different. You have to build an authentic brand. Yeah. that people can relate to and your people have to buy into that like you said creating that whole culture which is difficult when you have people here and there and everywhere so so how do you handle authenticity boy 
that's a good question. I, I would say that I, I think about this topic a lot more now, and we're doing some things now than differently than what I have done all along. Um, and without trying to get like too personal, I had some conflicts, you know, because I was part of another system, as, as you know, without getting a lot of details, or I couldn't. Yeah. I tried to, you know, when we started Flipner, I, I knew what I wanted to build, but I tried to hide. You know, everybody likes our logo. I, I, I like our logo. Mm -hmm. I like our brand. But <clears throat> I kind of made this concerted effort up front to say, this is stuff that I'm doing right now. I didn't realize I was going to be telling the world what I'm doing, but that's okay. Uh, is that I tried to not be the face of my own brand. I, I tried to like use the brand because I'm like, I, I'm going to be limited by my own capacity to do certain things. Mm -hmm. And I don't want Flipner to be about me. Um, and, and I, and I don't, but I think that people relate with people. Right. And so I think yeah. one of the things that we've, that we've kind of seen and felt is that, um, I am the face of my brand and whether or whether or not I want to do that, I have to have, there has to be a face of my brand and I, you know, I don't know who else could do it besides me. So, um, so I'm trying to, uh, I'm making a concerted effort now to do more of my, con more content in a way to where. I'm talking, I'm trying to talk directly to the person instead mm -hmm. of Flipnerd is this uh, company that mm -hmm. has real estate investing stuff. It's like, here's how we can help you. And I think uh, trying to um, speak more closely to our, we have nearly 100,000 subscribers now. So wow. trying to relate to people in a way that, um, that can help them. And truthfully, you know, I've kind of had to dig kind of deep because I've done hundreds of deals. I mean, there's a lot of things you do, just like you, when you have a lot of experience that you kind of forget that there's a whole bunch of people that have never done one deal or one deal. Yeah. And sometimes you kind of forget where you not forget where you came from, but just forget like how much, you know, that could right. be relevant to somebody else. And so I'm trying to kind of dig deeper and kind of reflect back to my roots to say, yeah, I had, these are the, I understand if you're having this problem, I had that problem too. Mm -hmm. And I've since moved past it and I have other problems. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but trying to, um, trying to go back to my experiences and, and things that I have been through before to share those with people because I think that there's a lot of lessons in there and ultimately I think I can help our subscribers a lot more if I, you know, if, if, if I try to relate to them. And, and part of what's happened is through my podcast, you know, we even call it the expert interview show. It's like, well, there, if you think of the amount of experts that are out there, there's a fairly small number of experts, right? Yeah. I mean, I've done 347 episodes, but now we're interviewing people for a second time. And mm -hmm. you know, we just kind of ran out of people. Not that we've interviewed every single real estate investing expert, but there's a whole, if you kind of think of a pyramid, there's a, there's some experts at the top, but there's this base of a lot more people that mm -hmm. just want to get started or they want to um, kind of grow from a doing a house here and there to doing something more consistently. So, um, I'm, I'm rambling at this point, Sharon, but I think no, just yeah. trying to like, trying to relate to people to where I've been before instead of, um, uh, where I'm at now, I guess. Well, that's definitely authenticity because, um, when somebody's having a problem, if you, you can say, well, you need to do A, B and C, it's one thing. But if you say, Hey, I had that same problem, you know, right. everybody has that same problem when they get started. That's very much about branding and authenticity because at the end of the day, you you are Mike Hambright who coincidentally has a company called the flip nerd. That's the way you build your brand. I mean, it's, yeah. People don't do business with Flipnerd. They do business with you and, and what you have created. And I think that's been a major shift that I've seen. Even if you talk about franchise businesses, the franchise used to be able to stand on its own and then you were part of the bigger thing. I don't think it's that way anymore. I mean, sure, the, if you're a part of a franchise company, there's a name. But at the end of the day, you are the, you are the face of that brand, uh, e even with all the you know, big companies have to offer. I think it, at the, at the grassroots level, you are that brand and it's up to you to be authentic and to create your brand and to say, this is what I stand for. This is what I believe. And you won't resonate with everybody, but you will resonate with the people that are meant to be your people. Yeah. And I think that is an important thing that you just said is you won't resonate with everybody. I think uh, there, there's plenty of people that talk about this stuff of not trying to appeal to everyone um in my opinion if you and i'm not i'm not like brash like gary vanderchuk or somebody like that uh, <laughs> yeah but but 
people either you either love them or you hate them you know yeah. so i think that there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that but i think whatever your business is you need to stand for something now a lot of people that watch your show i'm sure are real estate investors and you know how is this relevant to them uh in, in their real estate investing business more so than a a, a a, a, uh, somebody that has a show or coaching or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it's really important that you, the, this is my, this is my gut feels or my gut kind of belief mm-hmm. is that a lot of real estate investors out there are just the Mike buys houses type stuff or I buy houses or whatever. They're so generic that you just kind of blend in in the sea right. of things. And so I think it's really important to kind of have a brand, a brand that people can, mm-hmm. can connect with. But at the end of the day, especially people that you're buying houses from, they want to connect with a person, mm-hmm. not, not a company or a logo or a name or anything. They want a person that they can share their, they can, they can kind of become their trusted advisor, if you will, to kind of help them through. So hopefully that relates back to a lot of the folks that are listening that are, you know, pri- their primary business is buying and selling houses. Yeah, people, uh, and, and that is your primary business, but I think, um, you probably remember this not so long ago, people would go out and it was kind of like, here's my offer, take it or leave it kind of thing. They spent absolutely zero time trying to build a relationship or build right. rapport with the person. And uh, yeah, I had an investor call me a couple of weeks ago. He's a friendly competitor in my area. And he said, oh, you got that house on whatever street. And I, he said, by the way, how come they chose you? And I said, well, I was obviously the favorite. <laughs> but, the, but the truth of the matter was, that person resonated with me. At the end of the day, our offers offers were similar, but some, you know, that person resonated with me. Now, it right. might be tomorrow, Michael, Sharon, or Mike and Sharon will go out there, and Michael be the guy. You you gotta you gotta be yourself. I think to ever build a really successful business, and like you said, Gary Vaynerchuk is probably a bad example, but he's certainly <laughs> successful. But I mean, you have to go out there, you have to build an authentic brand, You, but you have to be yourself and get the people that are meant to be your people. And then I think the, the, the business growth will just happen. Once you kind of understand how all that works and you have to do a good job. I mean, obviously right. that's a given, you have to do a good job. But um, the other thing I wanted to kind of talk about is risk. You know, people say, oh, you, you know, you're just so brave. And I said, you know, everybody's just scared all the time, you know, but here's the difference. Some of us just jump over straight, dive into the fire <laughs> and the other ones stay over here and go, I'm not going in that fire. So what, how, what's your feeling on taking risk and smart risks and things like that? Well, smart risk. I don't know if I could, I don't know <laughs> if I could talk on that one. I've taken plenty of risk. I mean, we've been kind of investing or reinvesting. Like we've had some really successful years over time, but we have always kind of reinvested it back into ourselves, mm-hmm. whether it's investing in, in um, kind of postponing our uh, financial benefit from deals by turning them into rental properties, which is, you know, that's, that's risky in and of itself. I could have $20,000 today. But now I'm going to go ahead and take $300 a month because I think over the long term, that's the right thing to do. Or whether it's investing in kind of our platform, which we've invested an insane amount of money that I can almost never admit publicly <laughs> uh, in, in FlipNerd. But it's been a labor of love. But I, here's what I think. I mean, I think, um, you know, when I, you always hear people talking about the American dream, right? The American dream. The, the American dream. Or, you know, actually, I don't, I don't think you hear about it as much as you used to, right? Mm. But the American dream used to be like, oh, I have a, a reliable job and a reliable paycheck and I get to buy a house and stuff like that, which mm-hmm. I don't think that's the American dream. My, I think the American dream is the freedom to create, to mm-hmm. create value, to take risks, to yes. try to build something that is bigger and better than what you have now or can serve more people, whatever it is. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of people, I think uh, the without getting like political or anything like that, the kind of the, the establishment mm-hmm. just wants people to just keep moving forward and just working for the man and yes. going through public school and everything is just taught mm-hmm. to be, if you think about it, life is just at, at America as a whole, it's just a big production line and factory of education, then go work for somebody, then like, then die. Then it's just like, everything yeah. is like so, so planned out. And for me, that is just uh, not the way that I want to live. <laughs> Well, and I always think, and I think that's, uh, you are a true entrepreneur, and I always like there's a, 
a cartoon that goes around, a kind of a little picture that goes around on Facebook from time to time, and it's these little girls lined up at the at the ballet bar, and they're all lined up there, there doing what they're supposed to do, and the last one's down there doing a flip when she's supposed to be doing, and that you know you always go, there's the entrepreneur right there. She doesn't fit in. She you can't mold her into that line for very <laughs> long. Then I think that's kind of the way it is. But yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't think people, I think you, I hadn't really thought of it in that, those exact terms, but I don't think people are buying into that same American dream. You know, they're yeah. willing to take less money in, in some cases, you're willing to make different sacrifices to have the lifestyle that they want. And that lifestyle yeah. would be to be home with their children or to travel or to work when they want. Um, but they are saying, no, nah, you know, I've known plenty of people that quit big six figure jobs and said, I'm willing to change my lifestyle to have this. Right. Yeah, I don't think being an entrepreneur, it means that you have to do big stuff necessarily, yeah, but yeah. it means you're, in, in my opinion, you're taking control of your financial destiny or you're um, doing something that helps you have the lifestyle that you want, like you said. So I would say, um, you know, there, there have been times where my wife and I think about it, like we're going through a period of like, are we wasting our time? Why are we doing this again? Why are we keeping investing in this thing or whatever and we just kind of keep failing but it's you know when you think about it it's like we have you know I, I drop my son off at school every morning my wife picks him up I have lunch with my wife almost every day mm -hmm. we travel uh, a lot like we travel we probably go on six to ten you know kind of good sized trips a year mm -hmm. um, and we could do more if we wanted to and my business more than ever is virtual now so I could almost be anywhere mm -hmm. and so when you start to kind of compare it back to when we were in corporate America it's like um, Man, it's night and day. Like sometimes you take it for granted after you've been doing it for a while. But mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, not that we're there yet. Like we're still trying to work on improving a whole bunch yeah. of stuff. But I think in many ways we've kind of been able to build at least a lifestyle around a business around a, a lifestyle that we want to live. And that's at the end of the day. I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, and then you're each person's idea of the perfect lifestyle it's just their their vision of it and that's that's fine that's the true mark i think that is the true freedom you get from being an entrepreneur yeah and one of the things that i'd say is i i don't i'm going to say this right uh but i think um and i'm not trying to pat myself on the back with any level of success or anything but this is what i know about my business now is i'm kind of playing with the house's money now like anything i do i mm -hmm. could stop at any point I mean, I could probably, I don't know if I could stop working because I'd be bored out of my mind, but all these risks that I'm taking and reinvesting and doing things, um, I have a rental portfolio, we have some other sources of passive income, we have some other things going on, mm -hmm. that at any point we could just say, we're, we're done, like, mm -hmm. we're just gonna, we're just gonna take it easy now. And that's not really me to take it easy, but I think that that's an important thing to get to as a real estate investor, whether it's through rental properties, which is largely what it is for me, is to get to the point to where you're, you're, I guess, kind of financially free. I don't know how you define it. If you define it as, I have enough income from my passive investments, which rentals are never truly passive, like let's be honest, but from my investments that I could easily live on and pay all right. my bills and all those things. And everything else is just the game I'm playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a great place to get to, whatever that means you know, for you or people that are listening. Well, and yeah, and that is, a, you know, stop and think back to what we were talking about earlier about the, the American dream and you worked all your life, then you got a retirement and that's what you did. People think that uh, a, a perfect example is when I uh, was doing that last branding event. Um, we had a videographer there that was making videos uh, for people like an, a professional two camera about me video for, uh, for everyone that was part of the event. And when the event was over, the, the photographer said, I just don't even know what to say. This has been the best gig I ever had. Because he said, I always thought I needed millions of dollars to retire. And one of the people with, that was there was uh, had a pretty large uh, rental portfolio that he had put together really pretty fast because he left his corporate job at GE. And he's, you know, it, when this person was talking in the video, he was saying, you know, stop and think about if, if you, for instance, need 10 houses a month, what, and, it, and that's $1,000 for each house, how many houses do you need? How many paid off houses do you need to live a great retirement? That's what you need. You don't need $2 million necessarily. Yeah. And, but this guy was saying, oh my gosh, I came from a family of everybody worked in a, in a, in a place. 
They got their retirement, then they scrimped till they died. But it, it was so funny because you and I take all that for, we think everybody knows that. Yeah. But, well, yeah, I think there used to be this, uh, you know, you need to build this nest egg, right? There's like a pile and now yeah. I'm going to start, it's going to start whittling away. Right. I'm trying to plan like, well, I don't want to run out before I die. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, okay. It's, it's much more about cash flow, right? Not just right. I built this pile and now I'm going to chip away at it mm -hmm. until I die. It's like, why not have cash flow, build a cash flowing assets that last mm -hmm. you forever? Yeah. And that is that. Uh, <laughs> It, that's it exactly. You talk about a major shift in the way people think. That is a major, major shift. Right. Yeah. Well, um, this has been a great show. I like talking about entrepreneurial things. Um, the last thing I'd like to kind of touch on is I'm big on self-improvement. I know you're big on self-improvement. And I really think that if you don't um, invest in yourself, you, you're just going to come to a point where you can't compete and your business is going to die. What? Tell people how you feel about that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, back to the point of, of saying, of kind of in my business, positioning myself as, as the guy uh, for our platform, it's forced me to look internally a lot. Like, how can I improve myself? Because sometimes I find myself saying something and I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm saying something, but I don't actually do that myself anymore. Or you find yourself in these quandaries of like, I never want to lie to anybody. I don't, I don't I'm not dishonest about anything. But sometimes uh, I just find that it, it forces you, you know, there's a bunch of people that think that if you're teaching or you're a coach or you're a mentor, that that means you can't do it, which I think is a bunch of baloney, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bunch of, especially in the real estate space, I think there's a whole bunch of like guru type guys out there that that have never really done and are not doing, actively doing, and therefore they're probably selling something that, that uh, isn't true. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different thing. But I, I think that being a coach or a mentor or uh, teaching people what you know forces you to constantly renew yourself because you find that you want to improve mm -hmm. what you're teaching, but you know that you have to kind of improve yourself first. So I, I don't know. I think, um, I think it's really important to kind of stay fresh and watch podcasts and mm -hmm. listen to what other people are doing. And I, I don't think you should obsess on always learning from other people and not applying it. I mean, you've got to apply it into your life or your business. But I do think that a lot of folks, um, tends to get so comfortable in life that they just mm -hmm. are kind of drifting and they don't find a way to continuously improve. And so I've found for me personally, I'm part of some masterminds. I have my coaching program, which we've created a mastermind inside of there. I've just found that by surrounding myself by people that I admire and respect or that I learn a lot from forces me to constantly look internally and find ways mm -hmm. to improve. So that's, that's one of the things that I do. Yeah. Masterminds are powerful things. I also like uh, accountability partners are great for yeah. helping you stay on track. And, and you need somebody that you, we talked about this a little bit earlier about somebody that won't just tell you what you want to hear, that they'll tell you what you need to hear. And so that's the great beauty in having those people in your life because we all need that. Sometimes we just right. need somebody say, no, nah, you know, you just need to come down off a of cloud nine. This is stay focused over here or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show again today. It's always fun just to sit down and uh, have these conversations with you. And uh, folks, uh, y'all be sure it's stop by the Flip Nerd. Uh, that's a great site over there. Mike has a ton of things. Uh, uh, you can learn a ton of stuff from over there. So um, I'll put the contact information for Mike, um, you know, in the show notes. And Mike, thanks again. Thanks for having me, Sharon. Great to see you. Okay, and uh, this is Sharon Bornholt, and I'll be back soon with another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing.